Hi everyone and welcome to the last episode of Seek Sustainable Japan for 2023. I'm your host JJ Walsh here in Hiroshima. I'm so glad you could join today. What a special last episode as I join once again in a little sub-series with Tokyo area Tova Kinoka. Uh, in this 30-minute episode, we talk about some of the things that we think are real highlights this year in 2023 in, in terms of sustainability and what we saw happen in Japan. Now, on a personal level, I have seen more EVs. At the beginning of 2023, I was talking about how there still wasn't much movement uh, for electric cars in Japan. We still only saw a few uh, dealers, but now at the end of 2023, I see electric vehicle taxis in my area of Hiroshima in middle Japan and uh, small changes. You know, it's something to get excited about. Nothing, nothing too revolutionary, but it is a big change that I have noticed. And in this episode, we talk about some of the other ideas. So I hope you enjoy it. And as always, please like, share to a friend that you think might be interested. And I would love to hear your comments and questions if you have any. Have a look in the show notes. And you can find me on the socials if you want to interact. I'd love to hear from you. It's all working out so far. Hi, everyone. Good morning. Very early morning to you. Uh, happy end of 2023 and looking forward to 2024. This is the last Seek Sustainable Japan talk show podcast for 2023. And I'm so excited to have my cohort once again, Kova Kinoka in Tokyo. And I'm JJ Walsh here in Hiroshima. And this is our last of the short takes. Thanks so much for joining so early, Tova. <laughs> You're welcome. And uh, yeah, I can't believe 2023 is at an end. That's a bit frightening. It's gone very fast. Yeah. Before we dive into our top three, we each of us uh, have selected three things that really stood out for us this yeah. year. Um, but Tova, what's your overall feeling at the end of 2023? Are you feeling like we made some positive changes? Have we made progress? We just came off of COVID. So this was a big yeah. year, of course, for travel. We saw the borders mm -hmm. open and everything. Yeah, I think um, overall, I mean, obviously, there have been highs and lows throughout the year. Um, there's been a lot of talk and controversy around COP and the fact it was hosted by an oil state and, and all this kind of stuff. Um, but I think in general, I'm seeing positive momentum um, and an acceleration, I think, a, a sort of building of awareness, both at um, individual level, but also at societal and, and particularly in corporates like we work with, um, really increasing awareness of the importance of sustainability and the fact that this is not some passing trend that's going away. This is mainstream. This is the future and we all need to be on board with this that seems to be gathering steam um and now we need to see the actions to to go alongside that awareness right so i'm excited to to see you know how this continues to build and, and to drive action moving forward yeah how absolutely and i think um because the borders have opened i've started doing guiding tours i've started yeah. doing more travel destination consulting so I am seeing the positive influence of international visitors as well, yeah. who are expecting more because we know Japan is a little bit under par in terms of like daily consciousness. How do we think about packaging? How do we think about sustainability? And international travelers coming in kind of expecting this and asking for it is having that good positive influence. And so I'm, I'm really, encouraged and hopeful for 2024 and yep. hopefully this will continue and more businesses will see wow this is an opportunity yeah to be yeah. more sustainable right yeah very much so and in a similar vein we're seeing you know particularly coming out from europe a lot of regulatory changes um sort of ramping up really in the last sort of year or so which are driving businesses 
whether they're if they want to do business outside Japan, they know that they need to be on board with these things now. So um, that's also a, a sort of a positive um, driver, if you like. Yeah. Well, shall I start? Do you mind sure. if I start? Uh, mine starts with A. So I thought, you know, top of the alphabet. Um, <laughs> I have noticed just a boom of YouTube and social media channels all focused on how do we renovate old houses? How do we make use of the Akia? How do we go and live in the countryside happily, right? Um, yeah. So, so many fabulous, well-made, personal experiences of people who are renovating old houses, living in the countryside. So not just, you know, some of the companies that are like switch flipping houses, you can have yeah. a guest house super free, you know, like really cheap or super free. But these are people who actually moved into the rural areas. Mm -hmm. And so for me, that's so much more important because you see them developing the community, being part of their neighborhoods, right? Yeah. And mm -hmm. a lot of these rural areas are really struggling for population as a lot of people move away and these houses, have good bones you know they're still yeah. good to renovate they are great materials to use as a base and to bring it up to a comfortable quality of life you know yeah. so that it was yeah. really exciting so akia for me this year i really saw yeah. an increase of enthusiasm um so <laughs> i'll put all the great links to youtube and social media below if anybody yeah. is interested and that's really nice to see. So in a, in a country where, um, you know, we the general trend is to to knock down older buildings and to build brand new, right? That that's a, the norm um, around here. And I, I've always found it very strange coming from Europe, where we have very very old buildings, um, and old buildings are seen as more interesting and more valuable. I always found that very. Um, sort of uh, strange here that you know in when in many ways in Japan old things are really valued and and um revered and then houses would just be pulled down and they build new and I think well what's that about so it's really nice to see that perhaps that mindset's beginning to shift and being a people are seeing the value of these old buildings um yeah. like you say that they've, they've still got so much to give so absolutely and yeah. even on a personal level I've been looking into how can we do a renovation to make it more like a passive house like we don't yeah. have to build a passive house from new but we no. To do with more insulation it's pretty cold in winter it's pretty yes. hot in summer um and so there are companies that help you do that you don't have to knock mm. down your house and start again exactly. use what you already have which is more sustainable and mm. add another layer yeah you know? yeah yeah so very much there's some exciting new businesses hopefully i'll be able to introduce yep. in the new year uh, Natasha has joined us from YouTube. Great to see you. Hello, friends. Lord Crunk, uh, I'd love to renovate Anakia. I need an investment passport. Mm, <laughs> yeah. Well, you can get a really good quality house in a beautiful area for not very much, but you're right. There's a lot of other big costs when you're coming mm. to a new country. Um, how do you work? A lot of people who do this, they end up working online. Uh, yeah, keeping their, keeping their job and doing telecommuting, right? Yep, yeah, yeah, exactly. And Japan generally has good Wi-Fi coverage wherever you are. So even if you're in a pretty rural area, that's probably going to be an option. So it's yeah, good. absolutely. Do you want to go next? Tell us one of yours, Tova. Me. All right. So my top one um, this year is. My Mizu, seeing um, My Mizu, which is a wonderful social impact organization that um, I'm very proud to say I've been supporting right since the beginning um, when they first uh, sort of started looking for funding to get off the ground. Um, they've just gone from strength to strength. So they started sort of right at the beginning of COVID when it was really difficult to, to get anything moving and everything had to be online. And, um, but, you know, really the last sort of year or so, they've just ramped up amazingly um, and I think they're a great example of how a small organization can take a really simple idea so for them it's um, using refillable water bottles rather than you know single-use pet bottles um, and just really drive a movement with that um, they've got all these organizations now in Japan I think um, the latest was more than two and a half thousand um, 
uh, companies, cafes, etc., restaurants, shops that you can go into and uh, request to have your water bottle filled up um, just with the perfectly drinkable tap water. Um, they do beach cleans and things to raise awareness of, of plastics and microplastics and stuff like that. But they've also started doing um, some big collaborations. And this year they've got a huge one just starting up with Kirin, one of the massive drinks makers in Japan, really huge organization. Um, and they're partnering with them on sustainability um, innovation projects. So that is really wonderful to see that, you know, that they, they've started just from passion and an idea and they've grown it to the point where, you know, a global drinks giant is saying, well, actually, we want to partner with you guys because you're good and, and you bring something we haven't got. Um, <clears throat> excuse me, my voice is going. So it's really wonderful to see their organization really building um, momentum here on an issue like tackling plastics and ocean plastics in particular, um, and building the awareness, building the engagement, um, and then getting the attention of, of the big guns and getting them involved. So that's fantastic to see. Yeah, absolutely. My Mizu is doing great work. And isn't it fantastic to see them still going and thriving, right? Like yes. some of the great yeah. initiatives we saw years ago, they've closed <clears throat> up shop. They couldn't make it yeah. work. But mm -hmm. my Mizu is doing such a public service, but also yeah. great for businesses. I always yeah. suggest it when I do consulting for destinations. Why mm. don't you have uh, every place that you I want visitors to go to offering yeah. free water? And then you get yes. free on the app, you get this free listing, right? Mm -hmm. So it's such a great thing for the host, but also the yeah. customer as well. Very much. And if you're a school or a company listening, they they will go in and they'll do um, talks on ocean plastics and, and conservation and, you know, ideas about what your sort of school or, or company can do um, and initiate projects and stuff around that. So do get in touch with them. They're an amazing bunch. Yeah, absolutely. Um, my number two, I, I know you mentioned the Japan Times. It's great to see yes. a big major uh, newspaper, which is having a sustainable Japan section. That's fabulous to see. But mm. I always, uh, I was really happy to see the third running fabric sustainability yes. in Japan open source data. So they did their research project on how did Japanese consumers view more sustainable brands. Mm -hmm. And they published all their research for the third year in a row. They had a big event this year in Tokyo. They mm -hmm. brought in a lot of change makers and thought leaders at the seminar, but also did workshops for people who were trying to start to be more yeah. sustainable. Mm -hmm. What is B Corp, for example? Um, so it was wonderful, and they were a real highlight for me this year. I was able to go up to the event and be part of that. <laughs> but also just having that data open to everyone, yeah. right? Yeah. So many, like even the Japan Times, they have a, a paywall. So mm. that information is not available to everyone. So it's mm. it's wonderful to see Fabric still going. Yeah, yeah. No, that's really impressive. And the work they've been doing on on that report particularly, um, I think, is is really valuable to a lot of organizations. So I'm really frustrated. I couldn't make the event. I was out of the country at the time, but um, no, I'm hoping I can make the next one. That was, they're doing good work. Well, you did a collaboration with um, James Hollow at the yes. women's event in in the beginning of the year, right? Or in the last year? Last year, wasn't it? Gosh, it's gone very quickly. Yeah, um, yeah. yeah so we, we've been um, sort of collaborating with uh, with Fabric for a while now and very happy to, to work with them on stuff like this. So it's it's good. What was your next one, Tova? So my second point was um, looking at cross-sector collaboration. So um, I think just over a month ago, perhaps it was uh, November, I think, um, I was asked to moderate a panel at something called Why Ship Yokohama. Wasn't quite sure what it was at the time, um, but it was uh, the panel I was moderating was on green transformation. And um, 
the, the whole event um, was over a couple of days and it brought together people from uh, very senior representatives from national government, from local Yokohama government, um, from academia, from small businesses, big businesses, um, entrepreneurs, from schools. Um, it was really impressive to, to look at... Um, you know, to hear all the different voices and see them all getting involved. And they really wanted to to showcase what Yokohama is doing um, as an area um, on sustainability and uh, sort of open that up globally as well. So a lot of it was done in English uh, with simultaneous translation or vice versa. So it was really accessible to a lot of people. Um, so the panel I was on, I had a um, wonderful lady who was from Yokohama Minato Mirai 21 Heating and Cooling Company. So quite a long, long name to remember, um, Keiko-san. And she um, was talking about how they've got uh, over 65 different companies now. Um, Eriko-san, sorry, not Keiko. And uh, how they've got over 65 organizations in the local area all sort of tying up for their energy usage um, to track how much they're using, to um, reduce the amount of energy they're using by sort of sharing loads and um, infrastructure and so on. Then um, there was the uh, Yuxan from, oh, Yusan from Harch organization, which is a, a smaller organization, but doing a lot of um, media awareness on sustainability, a lot of community events. Um, they've done some in our local area as well, sort of getting um, just, you know, the average people on the street talking about sustainability and saying, well, this is what you can do in your area and let's think about packaging and let's think about how we're buying our groceries every day and um, sort of running uh, workshops and events on things like that. And then Eric Kawabata from TerraCycle, who um, are a really exciting organization that go and, and get the kind of um, the gomi, what's gomi in English? Um, garbage. Garbage. That, yeah. um, <laughs> That's hard to, hard to recycle and they, yeah, they exactly. have a recycle stuff, stream, right? Yeah, the stuff that doesn't usually get recycled, like toothbrushes or the, the inside packets from medicine, you know, uh, from, you know, pills and things like that, that usually doesn't get recycled that all people think it, it has no value. And they take it away, they break it down into um, base materials, which can then be used again. Um, so a, you know, working with huge organizations like E.ON um, to recycle plastic to make uh, new shopping baskets, for example, or to introduce their loop system um, where people can buy, say, a bottle of ketchup or whatever, but it's in a reusable bottle and they bring it back and that's, you know, re recycled properly. So um, it was really interesting to hear how all these organizations are really working with communities, with other organizations in the local area as well, because none of us can do this alone, right? Change requires systemic change or, you know, if it's going to be successful. Um, so it was really encouraging to see that happening. Yeah, in my local Eon Mall, um, I like to see the TerraCycle section and notice what they're doing. So it's a loop system. So it's all the containers are being reused instead yes. of single use that's the yep. biggest difference mm -hmm. and i'm really excited to see that section grow right yeah. because there's yeah. not a lot of products there but it's the fact that it is in eon malls all across yeah. japan <clears throat> that's a huge step in the right direction it's massive yeah it really is and in terms of building awareness for consumers on you know what's possible um i i think it really is a, a significant step so hoping to see loop expand more in, in the coming years yeah absolutely um i just had to let my cat in and then immediately <laughs> went right through the paper showed you doors so i guess i have a new project for the winter holidays. <laughs> for some reason cats don't mind going right through the paper doors and really why do we still have paper doors in japan in winter it doesn't They're work very pretty but <laughs> <laughs> not so practical so you may have seen me let the cat in and then surprise <laughs> that my shoji door is now destroyed that's okay <laughs> um my second my third point actually is about food mm. now i've i've been watching so many youtube videos 
about uh, the necessity of having more sustainable, mm -hmm. secure food systems. And so I just want to shout out and say thank you to all the people that are providing mm -hmm. organic, sustainable food for us in Japan. Tengu, Alishan Tengu has just been yes. a, a resource for me since I first came to Japan in the 90s, early 90s. Mm -hmm of vegetarian food, organic food, and they really support local community. Yeah. I know that they're also helping with food banks yep. around mm -hmm. Japan. Um, and my latest delivery had so much less plastic than usual. So mm -hmm. I see even this very sustainable company is always improving and yeah. always getting better, which is fabulous to see. Yeah, Alishan are, are really trailblazers, I think, in that, aren't they, here in Japan? Yeah, absolutely. And then just a shout out to the other organic farmers who have been on my show. We've got Chuck Kaiser, Midori Farms in uh, the Shiga area, just outside Kyoto. Uh, we've got, uh, this is a rural uh, area. Oh, sorry, these are people doing Akia. Uh, uh, back to what I was talking about before, we've got John Walsh in Tokyo, and I think he's, you've yeah. worked with him as well. Mm, he's yeah. done such great education projects, uh, showing people how to grow food even in urban areas, which is wonderful to see. Yes. I was able to visit uh, Heather Fukase in Nagano at her organic farm in just above Matsumoto City. And it's fabulous to see um, that she has actually been able to encourage other farmers around her area to oh, try a little bit yeah. of organic themselves. Mm -hmm. And it really has a bigger effect than mm -hmm. just what she's growing. Uh, yeah. Kyle and his group, the Permaculture Center in Okayama, are mm -hmm. still going, doing lots of great events there. But also in the beginning of the year, I had a chance to go to Fukushima and I met Yust Kraut and his project uh, taking hydrogen food trucks out Ooh. to organic farms and natural farms in the area and mm -hmm. bringing great chefs and bringing people to the farm to enjoy a table to farm mm -hmm. event with a hydrogen zero emissions truck. So there's there was a lot of great initiatives and wonderful uh, organic farming, people growing food, people highlighting those who are growing food uh, this year. And we need more of that because yes. in Japan, we still have such a steep decline in people who are growing our food. Right? Yeah. Yeah. Well, on that note, uh, to, to add to the food thing, so um, one of the, the companies we love working with here, um, both as customer but also collaborator, is Farm Canning, based in um, Zushi, who buy uh, the from the local organic farmers, they buy up the, the ugly veg, the moktainai asai, that um, would otherwise just, you know, the, the shops won't take it because maybe the skin's not perfect, the shape's not perfect, or this, that, and the other. And they use it to make the most amazing sauce um, and they also do sustainable catering. They've catered several events for us um, over the years. Absolutely beautiful food. Um, and you know, quality is is amazing. And just because it happens to be made from the ugly veg, you know, you you wouldn't know to look at it. Um, and of course, if it's in the sauce, nobody cares and stuff. So I think that's such a great um example of a small local company working with you know, local farmers to, to solve a problem for the farmers so they still are able to have a market for their veg. Um, the food doesn't get wasted and it makes really wonderful products um, that people can enjoy. Fabulous. Also, one of the big uh, things that we should all try to do is eat less meat and fish. And so shout out to Healthy <laughs> Tokyo. We just got a present of one of their amazing vegan cakes to us Ooh. for Christmas. Absolutely fabulous. Uh, we had a, a startup I talked with this year, Vegan Osaka. They're doing a lot of comfort foods, uh, which are completely plant-based. And I know there is a lot of movement uh, mm. this year. And I think that is also in part to the open borders yeah. and more international travelers coming, mm -hmm. asking for vegan vegetarian things, which are hard to get in Japan. So hopefully <laughs> in 2024, we're going to see even more things on yeah. It would be great to see more options there. Yeah. yeah. And uh, the last, did you have one more, Tova? Yes. Yeah, so my final one was just to a, sort of a, a comment on um, we've really 
I mean, we, we knew about it. We'd been thinking about it and trying stuff out over sort of many years now. But really this year, the, the power of transformative experiences um, as a, a mechanism to help people change mindsets and, and from then on into changing behaviors. So um, the One Young World um, Summit, we've been going now for well, since 2018 um, with groups uh, from of young leaders from our clients and, and just seeing the power that, you know, this four day summit with young leaders from all over the world and change makers, you know, um, thought leaders coming together and the power that that can have when people then come back to their own work to say, okay, well, I can, I can be a change maker too. I can do this. I can, um, whatever organization I'm working for, you know, I have the agency and the, you know, the, the power to do something. Um, and also this year we did the, uh, the sort of pilot program in Kamikatsu, I think I spoke about last time and just seeing, we, we had the follow-up workshop, um, a week or two weeks after we came back from Kamikatsu and just seeing the shift in people's mindset just from that three days, um, you know, looking at compost and um, sort of waste recycling and lo local um, social initiatives and, you know, social businesses as well. Just the, the changes in mindsets of the, the participants in that program was so impressive. Um, we did a sort of before and after thing. So we do this thing called ecosystem um, impact mapping. So before we went to Kamikatsu, we got people to map out um, in groups, uh, what did they think was the impact relationship between their organization and uh, people and planet in both positive and negative and in two directions like from the company to people and planet and from people and planet onto their organization their business and um, it was interesting to compare then when we did the follow-up workshop okay look back at you know what you did in that first section what you thought were the impacts that you were having and what you thought were the the risks or the opportunities for your organization in you know, uh, connection to sustainability completely changed. Like one group said, we're going to just scrap it and redo it. We, we've got a completely different perspective now on these issues, how they're interconnected, what we can do as a company, what we should be doing. Our, our responsibility is much more than we thought. Um, it was really exciting to see how much that shifted. So really looking forward to doing more of that kind of work in 2024. Yeah, that's awesome. Um, and Kamikatsu, you mentioned, which is part of my looking forward to next year because Ooh. I'm one of the judges uh, for the 2024 Japan Travel Awards. Thanks. And uh, Kamikatsu has been in in the past for the Hotel Y. And mm -hmm. this time they also have another organization, the eNow uh, okay. organization, which does farm stays and local experiences. So it's great to see Kamikatsu also developing right yes and like you yes. said when you take people there and they see mm -hmm. these businesses they see people yeah. who are making it work they're yep. doing it every day it's not mm. just a sdg check that target it's yeah. it's part of what they do as a business is part of what they do living there and i yeah. think for people to see that in action mm -hmm. that's hugely powerful right it really is it really is yeah what do you have coming up in 2024? What are you looking forward to? So um, many things. One of the, the first things and the one I'm particularly excited about is in um, or on the 7th of March. So it's not publicly announced yet. We will be putting out official comms um, in January. But the 7th of March, we've got sustainability in HR um event so it'll be panel discussion and workshop um hosted by a really interesting company called user base in tokyo um which have been very progressive in their um thinking about sustainability and in, in their reporting they've just started doing that um and are taking a very innovative approach. And their whole office is designed with um, sustainability in mind. It's a very interesting place to be. Um, and it's in collaboration with MUFG, one of the biggest banks in Japan, um, and SK Group, which is a massive conglomerate from South Korea. So we're really excited to look at um, what is the connection between sustainability and HR? So I did a short presentation at a conference um, back in October on this, and there were, it, sparked a lot of interest with um and actually the head of global hr for um mufg was there and came and spoke to me afterwards and went 
why why don't I know about this? What's going on? And let's do something on that. So that's sparked off this um, event. And we're going to be looking at how HR as a function could be supporting the people side of transformation in companies, um, which is really, really needed. Of course, the processes and the systems and the setting the goals and the strategy, that's incredibly important. But if people in the organization don't you know, understand what's going on and aren't on board with it, nothing's going to move. So I'm really, really excited to get HR people involved in this conversation and then see them take that back to their companies and hopefully sort of unlock some of the, uh, the, the places where things are stuck and get it moving. That is fabulous because if we can get the HR people to think about sustainability, start yeah. training and supporting yeah. their staff to feel like that, yeah. that's going to just transform not only the businesses themselves, but wider because the staff yeah. will take it home. Those ideas. Exactly. Well, right? Exactly. So that, you know, the reach of the, the influence of HR is everywhere within the organization. So I'm really excited to work on that. That's great. Any targets for you personally in 2024 for me? Uh, one of my targets for 2024 is I'm going to read more history Ooh. about women in Japan uh -huh. because I have one of the biggest complaints I had going yeah. to destination consulting, going to museums and doing consulting was mm. there are not women represented uh, in history in most places yeah. in Japan. So my personal dedication to learn more about the women in Japanese history mm. and currently as well, what are women doing yeah. in Japan? We need to highlight them and promote them and talk about them more. And then it enters history. We need we are making history right now, right? Yes. Yes. <laughs> Gosh, let's hope so. <laughs> Any, anything for you, Tova? Any personal <laughs> targets? To be honest, I haven't thought about it in detail yet, although um, I think uh, just sort of personal and work, um, looking for a better balance. I think mental health has been a huge issue um, coming through COVID. A lot of people have been talking about it, been reading a lot on that as well and about, you know, thinking about the sustainability of ourselves and, and um, keeping ourselves healthy so that we're able to do the best work we can um and 2023 has been incredibly busy very exciting lots going on um but perhaps looking for a better balance in 2024 and being a role model for the the you know our colleagues that are working with um but also for you know my, my kids as well um so that it's not all work 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 and they can see a better balance there so maybe i'll try and, and do something a bit more about that that is always a great target how to balance have better balance in our lives have better balance with sustainability it's all about balance too right yep very <laughs> much so very much yeah well great tova thank you so much for joining again thank you everybody for watching and uh watching on replays as well as always if you have any questions or comments please leave them below and we really appreciate any likes and shares if you would like to share it with a friend who's maybe inspired by some of these topics as well. Thanks so much, Tova. Thank you. Happy New Year, all. Happy New Year. Take care. See you next year, everybody. Bye. Thanks so much for listening. And I hope there were some great ideas in there that inspired you in some way as we finish this year and start a brand spanking new one. Uh, we have the Year of the Dragon 2024. Lots of exciting ways to harness that power of the mythical dragon and put it to use with projects that you are passionate about. I hope to hear about them. So reach out. Um, I would like to finally have a big thank you to Mr. Casey Bean, who is a podcaster of The Bean Pod and also an original musical artist and his music has been gracing our podcast all year 2023. So big thank you to him. You can support his music on Bandcamp.